the first thing that I did as an order of official business, instead of going up to my office at the top of City Hall, I went to the fourth floor where we had our permitting department. And I said to the woman in charge, I said, ma'am, I'm your new mayor. She said, nice meeting you, sir. And I said, I have a directive for you. She says, what's that? I said, if anybody wants to make a movie in Las Vegas, they have to have a permit, don't they? She said, yes. And I said, well, nobody gets a permit unless they give the mayor a part. So she said, you can't do that. I said, I can. I'm the mayor. Right. So two weeks go by, and uh, my secretary says, guess who's out here, mayor? I said, who? She said, Jackie Chan. I said, send the gentleman right in. <laughs> So Jackie I'm Chan, sure want to film he came in. He said, I can't believe what I just heard. That in order for us to make Rush Hour 2 in Las Vegas, you have to have a part. I said, absolutely. <laughs> and it was a great part. It was at the Desert Inn before they imploded it. That's even before you moved here. Yeah. You don't even know where the Desert Inn used to be. Oh, no, I, I know yeah, that. I have a lot of questions about it. Well, I'm things. sure you do. And uh, uh, they made it into an Asian-style uh, casino. And I was in a scene with Chris Tucker, Jackie Chan, and Alan King. And the movie came out cutting room floor. So I called up Chan and I said, you know, Chan, you know what I used to do for a living before I was a mayor? I used to represent the mob here, okay? <laughs> and I'll promise you one thing, you'll never make Rush Hour 3 in Las Vegas as long as I'm in office. Really? I am in the DVD. I scared him to death. Wow, that's awesome. True story. Okay, so I thought that was just a joke. But no. I guess that's real. Okay. <laughs> Somebody says, boy, you're, uh, uh, you know, I you're, you're using your theater. office. Uh, uh, for, for undue advantage. And I said, I, what, what are mayors supposed to do? Um, <laughs> but, of, co uh, of course, I come from a movie background. I played myself in the movie Casino. Right, right. And that was a real McCoy with Scorsese as my director and I mean, you're starring you're with in De Niro. Stuff, right? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm in a lot of uh, B-movies and C-movies, too. I'm even in Angel Blade, which they told me was going to be a, an exotic thriller. It turned out to be an erotic thriller. <laughs> And they did not cut me from that one. Now you're a YouTube star and social media star. Look at star, this. So it's just every every platform you can dominate, you're on it's it. It's amazing. <laughs> There'll okay. be some new ones before we're through, though. Okay, so I, so one of the things we like to do is, like, on our show, we have kind of this TED-style um, deal, there. but we put it on a talk show format. So it's kind of a more playful thing. And we like to ask questions about the people's lives. So one of the things that um, we like to start by asking is a question called, what's your tennis ball? And like the kind of the theory behind this, okay, behind what's your tennis ball is like, you know, if you throw a tennis ball, you know, a dog will just run after it. Like it sort of becomes like a, a pull, like a gravitational pull for them. Like, what do you have that's your tennis ball? Like, what's the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning? The well, thing that like you'd still like that kind of yanks energy. In well, you. Uh, my wife comes around to my side of the bed every morning and applauds. Okay, <laughs> that gets me started. Okay, I'm ready for the day, and uh, then I go out and uh, basically I can't wait to come to work here because I know that Leandra and myself and a photographer will be going out to the strip or to some downtown. Casino, and we'll be greeting a group. And as so I walk in, crowd that pull, like, do you, do you, oh, absolutely! Do you I love people, and, like, and uh, yeah. I love them because they have a martini for me wherever <laughs> I go. And now they're actually putting jalapenos in it and carving <laughs> the jalapeno in my image. <laughs> well, I heard at the NFR you had somebody just following you, right? With oh, refills? absolutely! Yeah. Well, with refills, she was yeah. she kept on filling it up. It was amazing. <laughs> Little lady from Weatherford, Texas. Right, the mobile bartender. Okay, so it's the it's really that feeling you get from like sharing the message of Vegas, which you're passionate yes. about. Yes. And getting people to kind of exactly. learn about that. Exactly. There's nothing I enjoy more than that. Okay, that's good. Okay, so the next. So that's my what kind of ball? Uh, it's called your tennis ball. Oh wow! I mean, you know, you can imagine a dog chasing it, but they're just little metaphors to capture the concept. Um, okay, okay. I, I think it's. Uh, I, I really think it's wonderful. I mean, you've created a whole new world, yeah. which is a great thing. A world of, that I am not used to, but I'm willing to accept it. I appreciate it. Uh, well, you don't have to appreciate it. It's a fact. No, sure. Some, well, some people don't. Some people well, are that's like, their I problem. Just, they want to fight it. You know, that's their problem. World changes. And that, that's their problem. I, I, I'm, I'm learning how to use my cell phone. <laughs> You're on Twitter now. Everybody can get at you. Twitter. Forget about it. Somebody said they're tweeting me, and I, and I thought it was almost a, a sexual connotation to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. But I don't know. No, it's okay. I mean, I'm not from yeah, Utah. What it sounds like. <laughs> boy, oh boy. Yeah, nothing sexual happened. So the next question is, if you could um, do anything and you knew there was no way for you to fail at it, what is it that you'd like to do? Like, what's the kind of... Well, the truth of the matter is, with my personality, I never did anything in my life which I thought I would fail. So you don't have... I, I have no fear. I mean, I'm, I'm scared of little do you dogs. No but, but other than little dogs, uh, nothing bothers me. There's not a human being in the world who, uh, who bothers me. Do you feel like you've... Don't have any regrets or very... I have no, look, um, 
I don't have any regrets. I, I married a, a, a wonderful woman uh, who was very accomplished. She founded the yeah, first nonprofit, non sectarian private school here in Nevada, very respected before she ran for mayor. People used to call her St. Carolyn, so I'm in good shape there. I've got four <laughs> she very. In the morning. She applauds me in the morning, and at night it's like Ozzy and Harriet, which you don't know about either, uh, where I come home. In the old days, they had an evening paper here instead of one that's tucked into the morning paper, which I, I can't still get used to. And I'd have my martini waiting for me, my paper, uh, a little fire in the fireplace. I mean, it was a great life, and four very accomplished youngsters. Uh, they're not youngsters, young adults now. One's an oncologist over uh, comprehensive, comprehensive Cancer. Uh, the other is um, a very successful lawyer. As a matter of fact, he called me just now and said that he got a new case of a former NFL football player who has some problems in Las Vegas. And my youngest son is a justice of the peace. And my daughter has probably one of the most important jobs in the entire community. She's the therapist at the UMC Burn Center. And, and that takes uh, some doing to get up every morning and oh, to go absolutely. over there and, and go, but she loves it. And uh, the wonderful grandchildren, wonderful, uh, I guess we would call their spouses, in-laws. And I, I have no regrets. Uh, I wouldn't do anything differently, really. I'd probably try to drink more, <laughs> but uh, uh, my, my liver uh, just, just doesn't go uh, with it that. just doesn't quiver in, in that way. <laughs> okay, so just don't I should be doing this, you know, I feel more? really, we, we shouldn't be in this office. We should be in an Airstream no, someplace. <laughs> We should be. With a fire in the middle of the... <laughs> That's kind of how these things usually go. Boy, oh boy. Yes, okay, so yeah. what, what are we doing here? Okay, we're just, we're just learning about you. This is, is that great. it? Okay. Oh, we have a couple more questions. So um, I wanted to ask, too, about, like, um, when you were 10 years old? I, I, I it's what a long time ago. What was it that you were doing with your time? Like, what was the thing that you were... Uh, what, what would you See, think I was, was the fun I, thing I was, a, I was a very, very uh, bright student. Okay. Uh, and um, I, I wasn't a great athlete. So I wanted to be a great athlete, and I accomplished uh, neither because I took time away from being a great student and became a mediocre student and tried to be a great athlete and never made it was a mediocre athlete. So I guess at 10 years old, I was a mediocre kid. Yeah, well, what'd you do for fun, though? Well, I mean, oh, you fun? Were... I, I snuck into my father's liquor cabinet and <laughs> started, to, started to train for my adulthood. Okay. Reminds me, I saw your Stephen Colbert video when you were bringing that yeah, up. Yeah, that's like, right. Well, Colbert. The you know, I, I wanted him to come out here. Yeah. And his whole staff wanted to come out and do a show here from Las Vegas, and now the guy's even off the air. Oh, yeah. Well, it was a good interview. I loved watching that. Yeah, not enough time, though, because you know what they said to me? It's very interesting. That's and it. you haven't said that yet. Um, they said, don't show him up. Don't, don't, oh, yeah. he, he, they said, don't take he over the program. I don't know whether I do or don't, but he, they said, don't take over the program. So I was sort of like a mouse oh, when yeah. he was interviewing take me. Take over this. I'm the, yeah. You're the personality here. Well, whatever. I think you're doing a heck of a job. <laughs> and, the, and one might think you're more handsome than I am, so you never know. Is he on the podcast? Howard there? is handsome. So, yeah. He's still? Okay, we, good. We all do. Some good. Of it. Okay. Um, okay, so how about uh, finding out like what it is... Um, that kind of is your superpower? Like, what, what is the skill that you think kind of brought you all the success you have? Is it like the way you can socialize with people or the way you can see big picture? I don't know. Um, to me, uh, one of the great American institutions is a jury. And I represented some very unpopular people and unpopular causes. Right. And I had to be able to make an impression upon the jury. And usually you had to do it in the first five minutes or else you lost them with the kind of clientele that I had. And you love. You said you love people, so uh, I and guess, I loved it. Yeah. But I, I found that jurors uh, are very smart. It's a, a phenomenon, actually. That you get twelve people from different backgrounds, and you put them in a, a room to deliberate somebody's life or freedom or monetary situation, and they fight with each other when they have no vested interest in the outcome other than to see justice done. And uh, I, I knew that if they thought that I was a phony. And uh, I have to tell you that my favorite book when I was a kid was Catcher in the Rye okay. and Holden Caulfield oh. and the fact that uh, uh, he, uh, you know, he, whatever his problems were, he certainly was not a phony. And uh, I would tell ju jurors the truth. And I'd be able to look at them in the face and tell them the truth. And if, if I couldn't tell them the truth, I didn't tell them anything. And the same thing when I went into politics. I told the people the truth. And the, the funny part about it is they didn't want to hear it and I didn't care. 
because uh, I was doing what I thought was best for the community. Yeah. So I went ahead in my merry way, and I was very lucky to have served three, four-year terms, and then they put me out to pasture. So I have no idea what the question was, no, let alone my answer. I have no that idea. Is, really a I, superpower I don't know. This is, uh, this is really a very interesting way of doing business. <laughs> Okay, well, so this next question might be something, this might be really easy or really hard for you to answer, so we'll see. But I, the question is, um, what is it that you You know, believe... you might want to do this for a living. You're, you're a very good oh, I interviewer. Love, no, I love meeting people. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, the, the lo my free time, so. well, the local TV people could use you around here instead of yeah. being the stiffs that they are. Yeah, I don't know. I got data science work to do. Anyways, so but so here's the, so the, one of the last questions is... Um, last? I'm enjoying it? this. Don't end it up. <laughs> All right. Well, Not even lunchtime. They hit record again. Um, the uh, okay. So, so what's one thing that you believe that not many people around you do? Like, is there a thing that you've always kind of felt like this is something I think is true about the world, or that I think should be, but most people don't either believe you or want to believe? Or uh, I think I'm a, I'm a little bit provincial in, in that respect. I'm I'm not looking at a uh, a global picture when I when I'm trying to answer your question here. Sure. It's very disappointing to me that. Uh, when somebody is basically volunteering their time, as you are here, and serving the public as a public servant, uh, and trying to do the best thing for the community that the media, that really bothers me, tries to paint the image that they want painted instead of telling the truth. I think they're very mendacious. And uh, the public, uh, they buy into uh, what they read in the newspaper and believe it, which makes them, in my opinion, not the smartest public in the world. That's something that really bugs me. Right, so the kind of the herd mentality? Just, it's not only a herd mentality, it's a, you know, one of my favorite scenes in a movie was A Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, uh, where Big Daddy, played by Burl Ives, is in the basement with his son, uh, Brick, and uh, uh, Brick knows that Big Daddy has cancer, and uh, Brick is pretending that Big Daddy is fine, and Big Daddy, after he has this conversation with Paul Newman, who's playing Brick, he says, this room has the odor of mendacity. And uh, that was one of the great lines that I remembered. I used to use that in my federal trials because I said, when catching a federal agent in a lie and perjuring himself, uh, swearing to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help him or her God, uh, I, uh, I tell the jury that um, the room has the odor of mendacity. So and the odor of mendacity means that you can tell something is wrong? Yeah, that you smell a lie. Okay, gotcha. So yeah, and uh, that uh, that bothers me greatly. Yeah. yeah, especially when a media probably just has certain sound bites or something. Well, it's not only like that. I, they're either stupid or, or they're uh, or uh, they're, very, they're, very, they're very evil. It's one or the other. There's, there's certainly nothing good about what they do. Okay. I don't know whether that's good or bad on uh, a <laughs> podcast. Okay, well, the, they'll I, probably have a very negative story about this interview, no, but I don't care because I don't read it. Well, that's, that's, Not a fact, know, but one power? of my doggies died. I didn't know what to do with the other half of the paper. Um, but um, so, what, well, you know, one of the great things about social media that kind of changes that, like, now people really do get the information from the source. It's not so much like they just get the sound bite. Like with your Twitter account, people can listen to what you say. Like on your Facebook, you can post what it is that you're doing right now, and they can they can talk to you instead of talking through the media. About and I, th I think that's a, a wonderful thing, to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I don't do it myself because right. I'm a dinosaur. But the, but the truth of the matter is, I really think that yeah. that's a wonderful way of communicating it because it's instant. To, yeah, and, and it allows them to talk to each other instead of the media. So I think it's gonna. I think I think the real truth about what you're doing is going to come out much more in the future. I hope so. Uh, I, I hope that uh, they don't use the media uh, to malign people, oh. that it's used in a positive way. You know, when your wife came out to do the uh, ribbon cutting for the container park, it was yes. like one of our most popular videos, and all sorts of people were commenting about their experience with her afterwards when she was like talking oh, to she's them, great. shaking hands. And, she's like, an honest person. That's great. I mean, instead of going to the media, they were just talking to the people that actually talked with her. I think that's great. Yeah. I, and as, as I say, if used properly, it's a wonderful way of communicating good ideas. If used negatively, I think it could hurt people who shouldn't be hurt because uh, of uh, malice. Yeah. Um, okay, so the last thing is I just wanted to hear what downtown was like. like the thing we were talking about at the beginning is like, I, I've only lived here for three years, but I have been as basically as deep as you can be in the culture downtown, but I just get hints all the time of all this amazing stuff that well, happens. So you know, you just... I'd be happy to do that because that was my passion. Yeah. Um, I didn't know what a mayor was supposed to do when I ran, and the the day I became the mayor, I was walking the same path that I used to walk as an attorney, 
and everything looked different to me, even though I had the same eyeglasses on. Uh, I saw the first signs of blight, didn't know what the word meant. You know, the doors being boarded up, that kind of thing. I saw that the lawyer's offices that I had known to be there were vacant because they were moving out to the suburbs. The banks and were moving out. And what year was this? This was in 1999. Okay. So and uh, there was no energy. It was lethargic. There was a malaise of... Uh, that, that pervaded the whole area there. And was that because the strip was just... Felt no, like was it's just that it, it, it just it got just... old, old and tired. And okay. um, the people who were in business down here with the casinos, they were, they were happy with making money while they slept when the slot machines were being played. That was all uh, they wanted. And there wasn't any vitality. There was no vibrancy. So I said, I have to create a renaissance. Didn't know how to do it. But I'm no dummy in the sense that I go to smart people and find out how to do things. <laughs> and I went to uh, a major developer uh, from uh, uh, Maryland who gave me a 101 course on how to redevelop a city. And we started to do that. We acquired the 61 acres we know as Symphony Park now oh, because yeah. that sat fallow there for years and years and years. Nothing was taking place. It was basically a, uh, oh, a, a field of... Uh, uh, that, that was a, a poisonous field where there was diesel in the, the earth and everything, and we were able to buy that property, and then we made uh, arrangements with the, um, the premium outlets. Everybody laughed. How can you have an outdoor uh, outlet place yeah, in the well, downtown? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's supposed to be out in the suburbs, but it's been a great success from day one. Uh, the Ruvo Brain Institute, right, the Smith Center, uh, the Smith Children's, Center, uh, the Children's uh, Museum, exactly, and the World Market Center and the Mulaski Building, and then the people on the east side, uh, East Fremont Street and up, underneath the canopy there, they said, "Look, the city's really serious about you know becoming a first-class city, a major league city. We better fix our places up." So you had guys like Derek Stevens go in, by the D. Uh, you had people uh, invest money like Tillman Fertitta in the Golden Nugget and uh, the, the folks over the, uh, uh, the plaza. Uh, everyone was starting to put money in there and uh, then um, uh, got real lucky. Uh, I, I met uh, Tony Shea um, and we had to have basically secret conversations because he did not want people to know what his plans were. And uh, yeah, put me, for moving Zappos or for, the, for the moving entire, for moving Zappos okay. at the time, yeah. and it put me in a very tough position because the city hall building was under contract with the Cordish company to build a, an arena there, and I oh, really? what I couldn't tell them why I was trying to get them to move because I figured to get that kind of critical mass in the downtown with uh, Tony and his gang, so to speak was the most important thing that I could do because that way you, you have the, the, the little markets, you have the bookstores, you have the record stores. Right. There are, are there records anymore? Yeah, I guess there aren't even records just, anymore. Well, no, actually, we're opening. It's retro now, but we are See, that's the problem. There are no store. records anymore. <laughs> I'm just getting into CDs. There's a new bookstore and a new record store right by the Bunkhouse now. Oh, boy. So they're coming back. I, I think, hope so. I hope so. Well, but I think it's going to be, yeah. I hope so. So uh, the, uh, I guess the greatest uh, moment that I felt as the mayor in the middle of the recession. I, and it sounds stupid, but it was so significant. I had three ribbon cuttings in the downtown on Fremont Street of the little bars that opened up, like, um, oh, like the Vanguard. The, oh, the Vanguard. Yeah, the yeah, Vanguard, yeah. and then the Chris Laporte's place in Sir Coin. Sir Coins, yeah. And I think the place across the street, it was either uh, the Griffin. Commonwealth or Griffin? It was Griffin. Oh, the yeah, Commonwealth came right, later. This is the first, right. first round. Yeah, and uh, yeah. it really was remarkable because uh, everyone was crying the blues that uh, Las Vegas had no future, that we're in the middle of the worst recession that we ever had, and nothing was happening. And I saw down there uh, the birth of... Uh, uh, the whole idea of uh, right. the, the revitalization. So, so I was living in the Ogden three years ago when I first moved in, and it was like we never walked over to that Motel 6. It was kind of a sketchy neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it was like, yeah, Commonwealth opened up. And, uh, it's where all the media, action is. And now all of a sudden you can go all the way over, yeah, like to the other districts. Some of the great, all all some the the great chefs are coming down there now. Oh, amazing chefs. Uh, amazing I mean, chefs. really, Cur chefs Curry, yeah, uh, Curry Simon, uh, his operations there. And Natalie, it's with huge. Eat. Natalie with Eat was the first one to open up, and now she's working huge. on her second restaurant. It's terrific. I, I mean, yeah. that, that's what a community is all about. And they say, uh, they, they use the phrase with me, it's growing organically, uh, yeah. which to me meant from within. It wasn't an artificial growth. And I think that's a great thing about what you folks are doing down there because yeah. the city really can do just so much, but it takes the 
imagination of young people uh, with new ideas uh, in order to take it to the next level. Well, the best part about volunteering for this project is yes. we've done the ribbon cuttings for a lot of the small businesses and tech companies, and it's great to see them all like one on one. The best. Like, they're all excited and scared it gets and no building better. something, and they all have their own vision, and you just gets see no better because, gelling. Well, the whole community is behind them. Everybody's yeah. hoping that they'll be successful Yeah. because that's what it's all about. That's awesome. I know I'm going to yeah. be here for a lot longer. So Say it again? I know I'm going to be here for a lot longer. I, this is I, it I, for I, you, I, I hope. I plan on living in Vegas for my foreseeable hope, future. I, I hope so. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll talk to you about Salt Lake. Uh, you, you have to, at least in the old days, you had to be a member of a club which cost you like $5 to go in, and then you drank little bottles. Yeah, yeah. I, I had like 40 little bottles in order to fill up yeah. uh, my, my, uh, my glass. Yeah, they'd have to serve you like the drink on the side, and you'd have to pour it. Yeah, it, it made a zero game. sense to me, but I guess that's the game you played. I don't know. There's as many hoops as you can get. Well, the great thing, there was a, an old federal judge there by the name of Ritter, and he was a maverick. He threw everybody in jail. He threw the prosecutor in jail. He threw defense lawyers in jail. He threw marshals in jail. And every night I just saw him. Uh, at this one bar that I went to, and, uh, he was uh, he was just sucking it up like I was. It was a wonderful, wonderful week in Salt Lake. <laughs> oh, that's that's great. All right, well, thank you for taking some time. This is it. You get back. Um, I don't have to go anyplace. Oh, I just start drinking again. Well, okay. Well, tell me about how you met Tony Shea then. I mean, I know you came to you for the the thing, but like, well, no, it's like a secret meeting. Uh, we uh, yeah. Yeah, we had to have disguise. Um, uh, I disguised myself and got involved. Uh, got in a, a car that had darkened windows. And no, really? No. Okay, right. okay, okay, okay. Uh, that's the way it should have. <laughs> I was like, it doesn't matter. He's got a bus. No, but he. Uh, it was okay. nice. We went out to Henderson. Okay. And uh, the first time I had ever been able to find Henderson, and um, you know, as the mayor of Las Vegas, it's not the place you usually visit. Right. And I saw his operation out there, and the first time we weren't talking about uh, uh, him moving into downtown. It was basically. Come and see Zappos, and I have to be honest with you, uh, I, w I was very impressed. Yeah, um, it's an interesting culture. It, 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 it's an interesting word they use because culture and cult are, are sort of, uh, I guess, uh, from the same uh, derivative root. See that? Yeah. Uh, well, no, no, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure, sure, sure it is, sure, yeah. Yeah, and uh, no one ever told me that, but it only makes sense. And I saw these people in their little, uh, little rooms, little cubicles, and they each had their own designs in there, and there seemed to be such creativity, and you, you, it was palpable. I mean, you, you actually felt the, these people believing in what they were doing. It wasn't just going to work at 9 o'clock in the morning and leaving at 5. Right. Uh, I never saw a place where, you know, they had uh, places where people could rest, where you could bring your, your children. Uh, I, I think I even saw a llama eating yeah, hay it's in, common, in yeah. one of the rooms. I'm not sure, but <laughs> it seemed like that. But it was different, okay? So I, I went away with an impression that this was something very interesting that's happening in this community that nobody really knew about. Right. And I began, I began to talk about it. I used that as an example of creativity. And uh, then uh, uh, a meeting was set up uh, b uh, by um, uh, a mutual friend of both Tony's and myself okay. for me to meet with him uh, with a, a pledge to keep it entirely confidential. Yeah. I, I even think we may have signed papers to that effect. Okay. And I was permitted to bring the city manager with me, and we went out there, and he had his real estate people and lawyers and everybody, and we got involved with some serious discussions. And I was criticized for the financial arrangement we made uh, with Tony for him to take over City Hall, but two things were accomplished by that. One, uh, we moved into our new City Hall, which I think is the pride of the community. It's a beautiful building with all sorts of public art in it, and uh, yeah. it's very inviting. And number two, we did not end up with an empty dinosaur in the middle of our downtown uh, not being filled. So uh, we really accomplished that, and uh, the people who were screaming and yelling at me uh, that I'm uh, entering into a deal that is uh, unconscionable to the taxpayer, I told them to go jump in the lake because... Right, because there's, there's a spark. Oh, the, you're right. You I mean, you can't, you, you can't put money on that kind of energy and that kind of creativity that I came into the downtown. Agree, yeah. But everybody wants to measure things that, in terms of money, and uh, I, I, I never uh, worried about money. I always made money. Yeah, I, I feel the same. Because if, if, if you have the, a good time, you make money. Yeah, that was one of the goals when I was doing data science at the downtown project is to try to find metrics that weren't money. To say, like, you know, this city is healthy, and it might make money down the road, Oh, absolutely. Well, the truth of the matter is, uh, money is, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying people shouldn't have it, but... Uh, 
it's it's not the most important thing. Uh, I know I know very uh, wealthy people who don't have health, and they uh, you would think that they would take whatever wealth they have to have health, and some people wouldn't do that. They'd rather keep their money and be unhealthy. I never understood that philosophy, but uh, there's more to life than money. Yeah, and I guess you mentioned that, and and for you that was. Finding your wife, somebody who's like supports you. That's the that most level. important thing. Continuing I to mean, like talk with Are you people. married? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay, well, when you get married, whoever you're marrying, make sure they applaud you in the morning. Okay. <laughs> I definitely, definitely will. Um, I don't know. I feel like I could talk to you forever, but I don't we want could. to on, we, so. sh we could. We really should have Tony uh, participate in the, this conversation. Yeah, well, as well. You're, yeah you're more than looking. Even if you don't stay the night in your stream, I, I can't. I can't. I can't stay night. up that late with you guys. I mean, you usually do this in the evening, do you not? Oh well, yeah, Tony. I mean, eight o'clock. I'm ever, drunk did after did five. Did he ever drink, make you drink for a net? Like, did he ever, the for net to drink? Did Tony ever ask you to drink that? What is for net? Oh, God, don't even start it on that. Okay, well, I let you go. You go back. You go. That's back. it. You got. Yeah, I think. All right, you great. go back to Salt Lake, and I'll go back to work. No, I'm going back downtown. Stay here, but thank I don't you very much. It. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, and folks, nice being with you. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Well, I, 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 I don't know whether we did anything. <laughs> no, that's, but that's what matters. Like, I didn't want talking points. I wanted to know you, and I think we really got that, and like, just how you feel. No, that was great.